Hey, everyone. Welcome to Plotting, a podcast about gaming, education, and everything in between. I'm Adam. And I'm Charles. We hope you remember to share and subscribe for new episodes every Tuesday. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, Plotting with Adam and Charles, a podcast where we talk about the value of play and games as a teaching and learning tool. Yep. Uh, so I'm Charles, and this is Adam, and we are both in the education field and in the gaming field, and we really... You know, we both exist at the intersection of those those two interests and hobbies, and we thought we'd tell the world about it, about what we thought. Absolutely. Um, and what we think is that play and games in general are an underutilized educational tool because they can really bring a lot of value to all sorts of education. And we're going to tell you the best ways that we believe for you to incorporate that into your teaching and learning experience. 100%. Something you'll hear me say a lot is that games or game ma making or game design is really just a study of motivation. And that's what people don't often see. And that's, but it's true. You're, when you're making games, you're like, how can I trick, you know, convince humans to sit in this one spot and do this thing for a long time? And that's a very same challenge that teachers face, right? It's motivating. And it's such a positive form of motivation, right? So I think there's Absolutely. a lot of lessons. Yeah, so uh, we're going to start off today, and we are going to talk about um, why we think play is underutilized, and we're going to talk about some ways that you can think about the lessons that games offer and why you would want to incorporate that into your teaching and learning experience. Yes, so uh, let's start with that first question. Why do you think, Adam, that games are valuable as learning tools? Well, I think the number one thing, like you said, right, is it comes down to a motivation thing. And, you know, over time, we will get into the whole extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation and, and things like that. But I strongly believe that games enable people to bring out their best intrinsic motivation by providing just enough of a framework and a boost that they feel supported in engaging with the content. Um, and furthermore, I think that games um, just make us think critically and think in ways we activate our brains in ways that we wouldn't do otherwise in day-to-day -day life, um, and especially not in the classroom. Uh, what about you, Charles? I mean, everything you said, I, I think that a big value in games is they they let you like try out things, try out new ideas, try out new strategies. Like, like they're so emblematic emblematic of a, like a growth mindset and it, like it it like subconsciously and and consciously helps you build that growth mindset like that desire to grow the desire to get better and really you're practicing practicing every time you learn a new game every time you're interested in, in like that you you know you're forced to grapple with something new or even within each game like very rarely is every game experience identical <laughs> is there any game where it's like identical every time Maybe like speed well, it doesn't sound like a very interesting game. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be less is. popular. People are like, what about chess? No, but the whole, like, every game is way different than chess. I mean, just because there are yeah. a limited series of possibilities does not mean that the game is the same every time, would be my yeah. response to that. But uh, you can see how that helps you I'm build a growth from mindset, a chess I master. <laughs> but, yes. You know that certainly they make more than one type of move over and over. <laughs> Checkers, then. That game feels... We're already like hating on games. Okay. Um, so today's episode, in addition to, you know, games, the value of them in general, a big focus today, I think, is going to be on different genres of games. Absolutely. Right? And, and thinking about, you know, beyond just, oh, well, I want to bring play and games and excitement into my, uh, you know, pedagogical manner, I think thinking about some of the specific lessons that various kinds of games teach and, uh, can be a really helpful scaffold for thinking about ways that you want to enhance your instructional environment. Yeah, I mean, I think teachers have a, I mean, educators and gamers have a lot to, they have a lot to gain by playing games themselves, like actual skills they're getting. But I think that, and they also have a lot to gain by considering what, like what each of these puzzles, each of these games are composed of and taking pieces of it, taking elements of it. Um, 
So for viewers that have no idea what different genres of games are there, can we list, should we start by listing some genres and then like kind of explaining through what they mean? Sure, yeah. Um, Not too much front loading? No, I, I, think, I think that's a great place to start. So I'll start off with one. Uh, you've got your classic competitive style tabletop games. Um, you know, everyone knows a game of this sort, whether it's chess, Monopoly, Risk, uh, some of the newer age ones is stuff like Settlers of Catan, Ticket to Ride, um, you know, it's like Chinese classic checkers. Games. The things yeah. I'd find in like my grandma's house or my dad's house. I mean, I think a lot of those are associated with that kind of environment. Family. But also, yeah, family games. Um, the, but the structure is that it's a competitive game. You're setting out to win um, and you are playing potentially on a board or other similar structured environment um, in which to do so. Hmm. You know, I'm thinking about it right now, and I, you're making me realize that there is no like basic family style game that's cooperative, is there? Or is there? Like, life is still competitive, even if you're not like actively, there's not a lot of interaction in life. It's true. Yeah. So, this is definitely a topic that we can spend probably a whole yeah. episode <laughs> later on, but. Um, I think, you know, if you look at a lot of the games that have really started to rise up and become popular um, recently in the United States and around the world, uh, they follow more of a European style game model. And by that, I don't mean, you know, like chess and checkers as opposed to like African or Asian games. Um, but it's a specific structure of game in which it's either cooperative or if not cooperative rather than directly competing with your opponent for resources you are playing almost against like the board or the game itself like you're playing parallel with other players exactly that, i don't know okay so that's two genres we've got classic competitive tabletop games and the european style game uh can you tell us a bit more about that what are some examples of that and what would um, that be like sure so let me think. Uh, okay. So yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, you've talked to me about this before, and I think you said Agricola is an example. These are like some niche games. We should I think some some that the listeners might have heard of. Uh, is Settlers of Catan considered that? Settlers of Catan is is kind of interactive though. Um, yeah, I think Settlers of Catan falls under the Euro game uh, structure. Um. Let's see what some other examples are. I mean, I listed Ticket to Ride earlier as a classic mm -hmm. competitive game, but I think Ticket to Ride is probably, at the very least, riding the line. Um, one that I have really loved, it's probably a more niche version as uh, well, is called Elfin Land. Mm -hmm. um, Elfin Land? I haven't heard of this, so I mean, what's this? Yeah, it's a, it's a Dutch board game. It's won all sorts of awards, and basically the players are each uh, representing a a young elf setting out on their adulthood and, and to to sort of commemorate this, you have to travel all around Elfenland um, and you have to visit, uh, you have little wooden markers uh, in basically the various towns that you have to visit. And so you have to find a way to travel to each town and collect your pegs and return back to the capital first to show that you have been the most successful. Um, in doing this and so to do this there's a variety of paths and each path is only can be taken by i don't want to explain all the rules to elf and land but uh basically you have limited resources which are these various types of travel so you might be able to ride a unicorn through the enchanted forest but then you'd have to fly on a magic carpet to get up into the mountains um and but what really makes elf and land and all euro games um, sort of separate from your classic competitive style games is that just because I have a magic carpet to fly up the mountains doesn't mean that you also cannot have a magic carpet to fly up the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, we're playing against the board and we're trying to excel and be as fast as we can against the board. And in the end, yes, that will have the result of I may be the fastest getting around and collecting all of my pegs and therefore win. But what distinguishes that style of play from something like Monopoly, right, or Risk, is that if I have Boardwalk, you do not have Boardwalk. And yeah. maybe at some point in the future you will acquire Boardwalk, at which point I will no longer have it. Um, and so it's so like, sort of the shared resource okay. pool and, and trying to do your best with this shared pile 
as opposed to directly competing with the other person. And uh, it's basically the concept of a zero sum game versus a non zero sum game, right? Mm -hmm. It's either, it, am I be, is my success coming directly at the expense of your failure? Or can we both be successful and it's just possible that one of us is more successful than the other in this particular metric? Um, another Euro game that I've just remembered, uh, this one's more popular though, still a little niche, is called Dominion. Okay. Um, How is it emblematic of a European style game or Euro style? Um, again, it, it's the same thing. You're playing from a shared pool of resources and attempting to be as efficient and effective as possible, but you're not directly attacking the other player. You know, each player might take their turn without ever almost, you know, this is sort of an extreme example, but in certain Euro style games, you might not even directly interact with your opponents in the game. You know, mm -hmm. we sort of think of like, all right, we're playing chess, so I'm going to take your piece. But in Euro style games, it's very possible that I don't interact with you at all on my turn. I just pay some coins to the, the cash and buy, you know, the card or resource that I need. And then I just pass it over to be your turn, but that I didn't directly interact with you. Okay. So these are two um, really like dominant genres of board games i'd say like I, I think there's a few exceptions i can think of off the top of my head there's like pure cooperative like pandemic maybe it's like all of us against the board but mm -hmm. um maybe starting with just these two genres comparing and contrasting them to a degree what are what are some of the the lessons of these genres for that either teachers could take away for their classroom or educators could use or possibly just the skills you gain in general by playing them what do you think sure uh well, I think first I want to lightly touch on some skills that I think are inherent in all game play, you know, almost regardless of what style of play it is. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into the specifics as we talk about each of these genres of, of how these lessons are uh, present in the various game genres. But uh, I'm talking about just some general things like teamwork, creativity, motivation, literacy skills, time management, um, and, you know, patience, behavioral Dude, models. Patience like. is huge. <laughs> Legit, my, my wife's a school psychologist, right? And one of the, mm -hmm. one of, like, a big skill that certain kids, I guess, need is, like, patience. And the one way you can teach them is just by playing a turn-taking game with them. And you're like, no, no, it's not your turn yet. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> but I want this thing and I have to wait. So, yeah. That's a good... Yeah, delay of gratification, absolutely. Oh, delay of gratification is huge. I read that's, like, one of the biggest uh, skills that separates, like, successful toddlers from, you know, the toddlers that aren't going to aren't gonna climb the corporate ladder of childhood, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. These are, these are broad generalizations. Sorry, okay. So, yes, there's a ton of, you know, we call these, to some degree, like, executive functioning skills or, like... And to me, like, many of them are... They're intriguing because they're not like tested skills, right? Other than literacy, mm -hmm. I guess, like if you're playing games, you're like, I'm building better vocabulary. A lot of these skills, you can't really prove that you've taught to someone or, or you can't, uh, they only pay dividends kind of peripherally or long term, I feel like, as skills, right? It's also interesting because not only are these not tested skills, um, and over time, our, our viewers will come to know that we have we come from slightly different, you know, perspectives uh, in terms of our professional educational environments. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something that employers really care about. That is very hard. Um, it's a very hard metric to measure, right? Which is also, I think, why it's not like tested in the school environment. Because mm -hmm. like, if um, we had an easy like the teamwork test during this standardized test. <laughs> Basically, the Hunger Games, and you're going to make little groups. <laughs> uh, exactly right. <laughs> so, with employers going, I stay on that for a second. Uh, I think that's a great point. Is that these are kind of the skills employers really want, but you also can't show this in an interview either. So it's more like this is how these are the employees we retain, or these are the employees we like promote, possibly because it. Well, and also, I mean, so you know, everyone knows about like the famous like Google and Facebook interview questions. These sort of like totally off the wall, like, 
you know, I think the famous one is how many pianos are there in the city of Paris or, hmm. you know, just these crazy, I know my, my dad did an interview once where they told him to draw the color red with a pencil. Um, like these things that really push the limits of the ways that you think. Um, and I think what those questions are really after is they're trying to see, you know, this person's critical thinking process and like mm -hmm. um, ability to sort of take a limited information and roll with it and figure out the best, you know, thing that they can figure out in that moment. Um, but of course they, they ask these ridiculous questions because there's no, you know, they can't just like look on your resume and see. Like, I love those lessons too much. Honestly, we need to have an <laughs> episode of the podcast where we like, We'll have like a bunch of them. And I'm like, I use this against you. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> like, how many pianos are there? How many tennis balls would it take to reach the sun? Using just the knowledge in your head. No use it. And you're like, ah, we should do something. Uh, Critical thinking puzzles, essentially. <laughs> or lateral thinking puzzles, maybe. It's like thinking yeah, outside well, the box. One of my favorite authors calls it the oldest game. And it's just, you know, you start um, and you say something. And then the other person has to present something that counters it. And, and the reason why. And then you just go. And, and this is so, sort of something that I think, I think the reason he calls it the oldest game is you see this a lot with kids, right? Where they're just on the playground and it's this imagination game and it's just totally off the wall. Like, I shoot my laser at you. And then they're like, well, I stop time and your laser doesn't hit me. And then the other one is like, well, I press my magical restart time button. Like, Yeah. Absolutely. That kind of that just game like, is really frustrating, especially when someone starts playing it when you weren't originally. You're like, we were just playing lasers. We had lasers and shields. And they're like, <laughs> I had an invincibility button or potion. And you're like, hmm. yeah. The oldest game has re arisen, then I see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So now that, now that I've dragged us off topic for a little bit, um, let's get back to our, our two sample genres here the classic competitive table and top environment versus the European style like tabletop board game. Um, okay, so do you want to take a crack at the classic competitive as, as far as some lessons that you think that teaches? Sure, Let, I'll, I'll just pick a game because that's easiest for me. I'm going to pick Risk. Okay. Hey teachers, here's why you should play Risk on your own time. This feels a bit like a callback to a feature or past episode. Uh, Risk teaches you to plan ahead. Teaches you life isn't fair. This is going the wrong way. Uh, I mean, risk. I mean, okay, here's the thing. Here's something. Risk really teaches you. I want to say like diplomacy. Like, like a big part of risk, I feel like, is that like the negotiation. I don't know. Maybe this is like lower level risk playing. Like maybe I'm only playing with noobs or maybe it's like higher level. Like after you're, you don't see it as like a cannon and little plastic soldier simulator. Like a lot of it's diplomacy. You're like, Hey, I want to attack you. If you don't attack me, like you let me keep Africa. Like I'm going to leave it a little undefended on your side. Cause then I can prioritize. Ooh, prioritizing Lot, lots of, lots of micro skills. Uh, but to me, I think that, that Resource discussion piece, supply chain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, efficiency. Um, but I do think that discussion piece that like back and forth and negotiation, I think there's a lot of skills there for, for students to learn. They can learn not to trust people. <laughs> they can learn, uh, um, you know, building that sort of, that's a real life skill. I think that it's, you don't necessarily get to develop in other ways. So it's very interesting to me. Um, you know, you said risk isn't fair. Um, do you want to elaborate on that, on that a little bit? Why do you oh, think risk, risk isn't fair? Because so there's too much chance in it. But I guess maybe that's that's like part of the okay. It's just one. I feel like there's too much chance in it. It's very nice. Like you can't guarantee you win risk. Do you know there's other games that if I play against people, if I like, I'm probably better than them at this. You know, this game I'm thinking of because I played it or whatever. I will always win. They have they have no chance of winning unless they're better than me. But at mm -hmm. risk get the right card combination or, you know, you roll the dice. And I know you're like, well, on average, like over, especially over the many dice rolls of the game, but also no, like sometimes you lose a critical roll and you're like, I should have had all of Asia, <laughs> but I somehow <laughs> rolled that over and over. So 
life's not fair. I learned that this, these are the game lessons I learned from risk. Hmm. Fair enough. Um, I don't know. I just personally, I think risk gets a bad rap, you know, everyone mm. or many people have that tale from their childhood of the 18 hour game of risk that ended with someone flipping the table and storming off and, you know, relationships were sundered. And I do think that risk, you know, is, is rife for that, but also all competitive games are, are rife for that. Um, but to me, risk is actually a very fair game. Um, okay. How? Because, as you said, it's almost entirely random. Like, <laughs> right? Like, okay. Like, you can enact strategies. You can be a total yeah. noob at risk, right? And, and it's a very simple concept, right? You, you want a world, you want to dominate the world, you want to take over every single country and every single continent. And that's, there are obviously strategic elements involved, and, and you know, like you said, diplomacy and stuff. But at the end of the day, it is possible for someone who had never won a game of played a game of risk before to sort of allocate their units randomly and roll the dice randomly and end up winning. Mm -hmm. And maybe that doesn't make it a particularly good game, but I do think it makes it a fair game. So more fair yeah. because of that that randomness. Yeah. I do think risk has um I do love how easy maybe maybe this is just being like biased, but I do think Risk is a pretty uh, low floor game, like like an easy game for anyone to start learning. I do think there is some some depth, eh, again, um, due to the randomness that you can get like better <laughs> at it, strategically better, like choke points and things like that. Um, I do remember, like I remember when I was a kid, one of the big like I must have played Risk at like that age, like that critical age where you're like just you know, well, it's like this, the age of like self awareness or something like. It like blew my mind when I realized no one had bothered to tell me that holding continent, this is like maybe my parents being bad parents, didn't tell me that holding a whole continent gave you bonus units. And my dad's like, well, that was like too complicated. So we've been playing like without that. And I was like, man, this is this game is has whole new levels to it. Um hmm. so that's one way to scaffold it. I don't I don't know where I was going with that. Uh can you talk a bit? How about this? What's uh it's your turn. Take a European style game, maybe. And tell us what are some underlying lessons of that genre, European style game. Sure. So I'm going to go with Settlers of Catan. Um, yeah. Well known. And I'm going to pick it because it is very well known for Euro style games. It's sort of the, uh, the first Euro style game to make it really big um, around the world. And I want to, for all the super good Settlers of Catan players out there, I do want to qualify my statements right now with the fact that I don't particularly like Settlers of Catan and I have played it a limited number You're of You're losing us a huge audience right now. <laughs> I know. What can I say? I just, uh, I, but I want you guys to stick with me. Uh, I promise <laughs> I have good reasons for, for this dislike. But I'm going to choose Settlers of Catan because I think it's a game that a lot of people will know out of the Euro style genre. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Sellers of Catan, what lessons does it teach us? First off, um, it teaches us how to utilize resources from a common pool. Um, it teaches us how to, within a limited environment, assess um, you know, the resources that we have access to and what else we may need. So that's you know, teaching like uh, forward planning and critical thinking. Um, I think, I mean, as in all games, I think it does teach some like, uh, diplomacy and like interpersonal skills. Uh, you know, most of us will play these style of board games with either our family or friends in all likelihood, not a random group of strangers and therefore people that we will attempt not to completely alienate via our behavior, um, and you know, that's tough for little kids, especially, but I think I know, right? I use it as like capitalism simulator. I'm like, I've got all the sheep, <laughs> it's gonna take four <laughs> of your bricks if you want even one of these. And I'm like, what? It's one to one, that's fair. One card, for I'm like, no, <laughs> welcome to the real world, kid. <laughs> um, well, but yeah, I mean, and but at the same time, you probably don't just sit there and be like, no. 
you can't have any sheep. I'm grinding this game out. I may only get one brick every 20 turns, but I do get a brick and you can never get a sheep. I mean, I'm not going to say I haven't done that. that like, unless that's like, I'm going to lose. Like, you're right, though. The game, I do like that the game tends to reward cooperation. And I think it's maybe one of the first games I've played, again, because I'm like in that same genre of, of most American gamers who like, started with family tabletop games and then moved into European games starting Settlers Catan was it my first game with like real active like live trading because you I mean I guess technically you can do that in I want to say Monopoly you can be like hey mid, mid game can I buy this random thing from you sort of but it's not like as incentivized like Settlers Catan I, I love that like back and forth like mm. resource cooperative don't jump down my throat uh, internet people but I actually think that that is a very very popular house rule for Monopoly I don't believe that the Monopoly rules, as written, actually allow for trading. Okay, Monopoly it does have some crazy house versus real, yeah, <laughs> versus actual rules that like some people ignore and don't ignore. That's why when okay, you go but, to someone else's house, like you just never yeah. know what the Monopoly. It, dude, it's really like. it makes me very uncomfortable. I'm like, okay, can we? I always lay it out. I'm like, are we playing exactly by the rules, or? Not, and I want to know the deviations right now because I cannot get into this game. And then later, like, no, you don't. You need two monopolies in a row or something. And I'm like, what type of crazy house? Oh, I don't, you get all this money on free parking, but then I landed there early. <laughs> uh, I think okay, that's okay. actually, um, you know, and whether that's a game that we would, a, a lesson that we would want our games to teach, um, it's a common story, right? Everyone has that story of playing with their bigger brother or like their cousin or like a, an acquaintance who's teaching you a game for the first time. And, uh, or you, like you just said with your, your parents, right? You, you've you been playing the game and you think you're finally starting to get it. And then they're like, oh, and by the way, there's this other rule. You didn't know about it, but I'm going to win now because I did. Um, and so I think, you know, teaching people to, to think about more than just the surface level, like what are the implications of various things? Or, you know, in the end, you may just end up being like my mom and like, refuse to play a game unless you can sit down with the rule book for like an hour and a half first and that's okay too mm -hmm. but um but i think there's some lesson lessons that, of yeah like empathy there to a degree yeah. like someone send that to you now you can choose not to do that <laughs> to the little kid in the future or like what's the proper way to to reveal the fact that you get bonus resources for owning all of asia or all of europe is it in the middle of the game once you own Europe? Or is it maybe in the second game after you played with your modified <laughs> like full set? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Should we try? Let's get into uh, should we do more more board games or, or get into video games? I feel like to, to expand. We should go sure. I kind of have to dive games. into video let's, games. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's jump away. We'll we we'll come back to some more like real life, like physical games in a bit, but Let's do some video game stuff. Sure. All right. uh, what's your favorite video game? And then we'll just talk about that one. That way we can talk so much about it. Uh, well, that's that's a hard thing to ask someone. I've liked a variety of video games and I continue to like them. I mean... What game has the most hours played? What game? Like, literally, if you went to, you know, Steam or your brain, what, what would have the most hours invested? Uh, probably Elder Scrolls Online or World of Warcraft. Is that because MMORPGs are the best style of game? I mean, I might argue yes, but <laughs> sure, no. sure. I don't, I don't know that MMORPGs are the best style of game. Certainly not for everyone, but they're a style of game that I really, really enjoy. So, well, what are the? Let's, let's break us down. So, again, new viewer has no idea what an MMORPG is. Tell us what what Fair is enough. an MMORPG. This All is right, the genre well, that Adam apparently specializes in. <laughs> All right, so an MMORPG, uh, that's a lot of letters, which stand for a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And there's actually a lot to break down in that title because it, and the, the reason it's sort of this crazy acronym is that MMORPGs didn't just spring up out of nowhere, they emerged over time. So it all starts with RPGs. Yeah, let's know. walk it back, you're right. Let's yeah. start with RPG. In case someone has no idea what an RPG is, yeah, so an What's RPG an RPG? is a role-playing game. Um, this can either be a single-person game or a multi-person game, but the what makes a role-playing game different from another game is that you, 
as the player of the game are taking on the challenge of accomplishing goals uh, on behalf of a character within the game. Yeah, you so, embody like you know, one character, right? That's that's exactly. kind of a trademark of RPGs. Exactly. Like if we jump back for a second to like our, our board games, when you play Monopoly, you are not representing the interests of the shoe. You know, you you may be using the shoe as a token, but you're not playing the game as the shoe. You don't make decisions one way or another because the shoe would like you to do them that way. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the characteristic thing of an RPG is that you, like you as the player and you as the character are more closely merged. What are some, is there any common RPGs that like, let's say non-gamer people would have played? And then if we can't think of any of those, then at least some they should be familiar with. Like Zelda, like Link. Link is with Zelda from, uh, or Link, I guess, from the Zelda game series. I feel like most people would be aware of. But is there any like tabletop game that kind of, ex I'm, I'm thinking no off the top of my head. I don't, a choose your own adventure book. <laughs> that could be a. Yeah. Yeah, Choose Your Own Adventure Book is is basically a, a text-based RPG. Netflix's um, Bandersnatch. There we go. You've all played an RPG game. I, I assume. Is that a different... All of our users have... Uh, have that, those are your two choices. You've either played games or you watch Netflix, right? Isn't that everyone in the world? Or you read books, which we already did the Choose and Your Own Adventure. And then we did Choose Your Own so. Adventure. So we... That's it. Everyone listening you, to this You podcast, read Lord of the Rings you and you erase listening. Frodo and you write I every time. And there you go. That's almost... A homemade children. Yeah. <laughs> I guess any first person uh, book actually counts then with that definition. Hmm. But sure. Okay. What are some common RPGs? Maybe everyone's heard of them. Uh, sure. So you brought up The Legend of Zelda. That's definitely a classic. I would say, um, you know, looking back, there's stuff like uh, Baldur's Gate 1. Mm -hmm. um, we've got entries like. Uh, there's a really famous, like, old-school text-based one. It was one of the Thief? earliest. Is that what it's called? No, okay. Uh, I'm trying to... I'm going to keep naming some while you do that. Here I go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every go single Final Fantasy game. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons is a tabletop RPG role-playing game. Um, every game... Fallout 3. Fallout, the whole series. <laughs> one, two, and three. Uh... And four. Um, the Elder Scrolls. Uh, Elder Zork Scrolls was, was the game that I was thinking of. What um, game? Zork. Oh, I have heard of that. Yes. These are like, yeah. we're starting to reach like Ready Player One 80s references. Like exactly. That old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they, that's what an RPG is. And starting with just RPGs, what are some good skills we're gaining from them? And maybe what are some ideas we can bring into education? Sure. Um, so I think. Uh, generally, the RPG format sort of forces like some literacy, some vocabulary, because, and whether this is a good thing or not, um, you know, games are written to be appealing, but not necessarily to be instructionally sound. And so, you know, I know adults who play like RPGs or MMORPGs and learn new words while they're playing because, like, some NPC says, you know, uh, the advent of this. And they're like, advent? Is that like an advent calendar? And then they have to go look it up. Um, so, oh, you know, I remember that. being a kid and not being able to read well and trying to play RPGs. and Or like, maybe I couldn't read well. Or maybe it was like, I was just lazy. I was like, click, 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 click. I don't care. And then you're very confused. You're like, oh, they're, especially like old school, you know, World of Warcraft, modern players. You're so used to like, you know, a line leading you to the pigs and then a counter that's like 12 eggs. And you're like, good. I didn't know. I don't know why I'm killing these pigs, but it's telling me to kill. I'll kill 12 of them. Okay. But oh I'm God, telling you, like, like old school kill. RPGs used to. Yeah. <laughs> old school RPGs. I feel like I played a lot of games that didn't spoon feed you. And you're like, someone's like, no, I'm not. Oh, I wish. I really wish I had the ingredients for this potion. And it's in like this big block of text. And he's like, probably something sour and like something red. And it's like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I don't care what you're saying. And then I'm just standing there and I'm like, well, what does this guy want? And he's like holding out his two hands and, you know, it's like an orange and like that red hat over there. But I don't know that. Like, I, I didn't read through that. So definitely a lot of RPGs, I think, are rewarding of literacy. And in many ways, I use that instructional literacy in the best way, in the most natural, like immediately rewarding way. It's so, it's so different doing that, right? Than like, I've got all these flashcards of like, uh, you know, 
what is literacy a noun? words. What is yeah. a verb? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, so I also think you, you didn't even address this, but patience, you know, I think mm -hmm. RPGs teach us patience because, and delay of gratification too, to come back to that, because, you know, you can click, click, click all you, you want, but at the end of the day, um, you know, RPGs tend to be based around sort of like a long-term quest line and you're not going to be successful in the long term by just clicking through. I mean, I remember the first time I played a Legend of Zelda game, and I'm struggling to remember which exact title it was. Um, you know, remember I what system it was on? It was on the Game Boy Color. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's a lot there, I feel like. <laughs> exactly. At least three. Um, but I remember <laughs> just getting totally stuck on this puzzle and I, as far as I knew, there was no way forward. Um, and then it turns out, like, all you have to do is, like, right outside the room of that puzzle, there's, like, a little board or something that you have to go up mm -hmm. and interact with to read it, that there's a super obvious hint on it. But I didn't go read the board. I was charging ahead right through the door. Um, uh, and so that's another skill, too, is, is sort of situational awareness. Um, I want to say with patience and delay of gratification... I think it does it in a lot of a lot of cool ways. So one, like you said, a lot of games won't let you win, won't let you finish without patience and delay of gratification, without like spending time doing these things. But I also think like the wisdom that us us older gamers have uh, after the many games and again the many lifetimes we've lived doing these things through like a whole RPG. I think you learn parts of you. Part of you realizes that like the richness of the experience is kind of robbed, even if you can finish the game. Even if you are like, blah, 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 just power leveling, you know, like, I'm not really, I don't really care about the storyline. I think the, I don't know, maybe that idea of like, the more you put in, the more you get out. Mm -hmm. RPGs tend to be very, at least in my experience, are very emblematic of that because the more you read, the more you invest in the story, the more meaningful, you know, a well-written RPG, uh, the more like the ending hits you or the more like, you know, oh man, Mass Effect is so great at this. It makes you love characters, and then like a ton of characters, you know, like not a lot, a ton, I think six characters, and then like parts of time you have to like sacrifice them. They're like, one of us is gonna, and you're like, and like that's like the real funness of the game. Like, otherwise, parts of it are just like a mediocre shooter. Oh, sorry, we just lost a bunch of audience again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Mass Effect fanatics. Mass Effect. Fanatics. Mm, how could you yeah. do this to us? Really shooting us in the foot here. Um, all right, so now that we've sort of walked through RPGs, uh, let's go back to the MMO sure. portion. Sure, Adam's favorite games, massively multiplayer online RPGs. And he likes two of them, so it must be very addicting or something. Something. I have actually played many more than two, but those two are, are sort of have been my two great loves throughout my life. All right, so what does massively multiplayer online mean? Um, this is something that came about, you know, with uh, the ease of accessibility of the internet to a wider population. And it basically means that instead of just playing yourself through this story and, you know, like in the Legend of Zelda games or any other single player RPG where you are the character and you are going through the story and you get to the end and then you're done with the game. In an MMORPG, you are a character playing within the story but your story may not be the same as someone else's story. Your experience is different from someone else's experience. And, you know, you may need to team up with someone or maybe your goals are not aligned and you may need to, to have some conflict with someone else, a real live person. Um, and I would actually argue that the rise of the MMORPG um, was sort of the predecessor. Um, this is getting off topic to a, to a future episode for sure, but... For those who are unaware of this, which I'm sure is many um, amongst the general population of the world, uh, tabletop role-playing games, the sort of the predecessors to MMO role-playing games and video-based role-playing games, are having a big resurgence right now. And to me, that resurgence is likely fueled by the fact that when you play a tabletop RPG, you just get to interact directly with other people. And I mm -hmm. think in a world of, you know, digital, 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 and, and you can have, find any information that you want online all the time. And, you know, you can play hundreds of games in a single day. You can just download whatever you want. It's very gratifying to have to actually like, okay, let's find a time that works for all like four to six of us to sit down and play this game. And this game, you know, it, 
we may never finish this game. This game is all about the story and the journey itself. Um, but so that's what the MMO experience is. It, it takes that, you know, getting together with four to six of your friends or, or people in the nearby geographic area mm -hmm. and blows it up to a global scale. You know, you can be playing with side by side with someone from Japan, side by side with someone from France, like, and I think that's pretty cool. There's kind of a beauty of to that. Like I, so I played a ton of World of Warcraft. I've actually played a, apparently a lot of Elder Scrolls Online, which just shows you how addicting that game is. Because I was like, very recently realized it's my most played game on Steam, despite me, I swear, only playing it for like a month. Or <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, like okay. So one, there's a beauty to the fact that it can bring together people from all around the world or people from all around, you know, different groups, and uh, like it's almost like to some degree, recreating that tabletop RPG experience, Dungeons and Dragons, but, you know, online, fetter graphics, and there's a lot more fluidity. You don't have to deal with scheduling people, right, until you get to, like, high tier, like, guild stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the roles. I think an underrated uh, lessons or experience from MMORPGs, or RPGs in general, role-playing games, any sort of where you play a role, is... I don't know how to describe this. It's like you get to try on different hats. You get to be different people in a way that, you know, outside of improv events, maybe you don't get to, like, like or theater. Like, and, but like in these, you're like, you can write your own play. Like, you can be, you can be the villain for a day. You know, you can go around mm -hmm. PvP and you'll feel like, like, how gratifying is that? Is that actually gratifying? Like, and I got to try it and I get it without, you know, in a safe environment. How, you you can you get multiple chances to make friends, right? You're like, because there's new people you're interacting, new people. Like being able to wear a new role, I'm I'm gonna claim as a pretty unique experience in life. Is there like where else do you get to just reinvent yourself and like make choices that in real life so many times you're you know, we get some choice, but you're you're really stuck with being, you know, who you are, like in, in many ways. And we just accept that and we embrace it. But in MMO, you're like. I want to be this. I want to be, you know, or like a different type of person. And I think testing that out and seeing what that life is like and seeing, uh, I don't know, no, I, there's a lot of lessons I, there. I think there's a huge amount of lessons there. I mean, as you said, how would you do, even do that in real life, right? Like, yeah, you, you have to like throw For a day, I'm going to be a bank robber. I'll try it out. <laughs> Whoa, this is terrible. <laughs> like, that was awesome. <laughs> I don't know, but like, yeah. Right. But even without bank robber, right? Like, <laughs> you know, you hear these stories of people who just like vanish out of their life and then like 20 years later, they it turns out. Oh, they're like few. Left that behind their life as a, yeah. like an accountant and they went and started a farm, you know, in like Nebraska from moving from New York City. Like, but that's a huge Reinvent themselves. investment and like a, a big risk. And, and yeah, absolutely. An online RPG gives you a chance to just try different things out. Um, I also, since we are talking about the lessons learned um, from various games, I want to touch on uh, a different kind of role that exists within um, MMORPGs and um, sort of RPGs in general, which is the role of like, the role you play in a group or what's called a party traditionally. It's like group um, dynamics or how to, how to make friends and influence people. I don't know, whatever that's called. <laughs> No, that's more like what you were talking about. I'm literally talking about like the strategic roles. So we've got okay. traditionally three, the tank, the healer, and the Ooh. DPS or DD, uh, but basically the, the damage dealer. Um, and, you know, going back to like old school RPGs, your tank is, you know, like your fighter. They might have a sword and shield or like a barbarian who takes less damage while they're in this like rage fugue state. Um, you've got your healer. This is a character who specializes in support spells and, and helping out their allies and, uh, you know, literally healing them sometimes. And then your damage dealers. <laughs> Good healers. Oh, they heal others. Archers. Um, you know, characters that deal Rogues, with wizards. Damage. Wizards, yeah. Warlocks. Wizards, all, yeah. all sorts of... Every game ha has different terms for, for, you know, the specific classes and stuff within these roles. But... What I think is important here is that the RPG environment teaches you the value of what other people are bringing to the table and of asking, you know, other people what their challenges are. Um, you know, it, 
if you're trying to get through a dungeon or a difficult raid or just, you know, do some questing around the land and you're grouped up with one or two, maybe more people, mm -hmm. you know, in the online environment, it can be very easy to just be like, oh, these people are really terrible. Like, we're not succeeding this quest. I'm leaving and going finding other people. And that's fine. I mean, like you said, the online experience gives you the chance to, to reinvent yourself and go find that other group of people and find success there. But it also provides you the unique opportunity to say to these people like, hey, like Mr. Tank, man, I see you're dying a lot to, to that one monster. Uh, what can we do to help you? And then, you know, they, it, it's really encouraging this active teamwork and active like empathy for others' struggles, um, working together to find solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you start that conversation, instead of the like, oh, you're terrible conversation, it becomes, oh, well, yeah, that guy is the one killing me, but it's actually because this other one is stunning me from behind. And, and then it's like, okay, well, maybe our damage dealer can focus that stunning one because it's a little weaker. Like he can kill it really fast before it stuns you. And then you'll be able to hold on to the hard hitting guy. Um, and so, you know, that's a, definitely a skill that i like that you're highlighting something yeah unique to mmo rpgs because this is very different an rpg game like a standard one player rpg game mm. uh maybe doesn't cover that but you're right mmo rpgs have so many parts where you are forced not just to work with like other people but like to work with different people to work with like people who have skills that you probably don't know yet like especially you're like new to a game like that are completely different and you have to realize like everyone has strengths and weaknesses and it you know, kind of like in an artificial, but like what becomes a very real way because everyone's bought into it. Uh, like all of our strengths and weaknesses, like we have to figure out how to balance them and really how to utilize them like together to, to defeat most dungeons and most enemies in like modern RPGs. And I want to say, you, you, you spoke on something that reminded me of uh, the difference between old school World of Warcraft and modern World of Warcraft. So mm. long time gamers <laughs> and people that have played World of Warcraft for a long time will know that it's gone through a lot of changes. And that's for a lot of reasons, like, you know, you're always updating games, coming up new ideas. But there is this really interesting phenomenon in World of Warcraft where a lot of people miss the old days. Well, you're like, well, that's not, everyone's nostalgic. But it's like, they miss the old days for really unique reasons, is what I'd say, okay? And it, the unique reasons being, they miss the old days for its inefficiencies like something that blizzard the creators of world of warcraft did is they made a lot of things easier like making a group oh now it's as easy i i click a dungeon and like immediately you know like all these random people from around the world get teamed up with me and we're like okay we're gonna work together right and like if not i'll leave and just find a new group because it's like that okay but old school world of warcraft i think a major aspect that people kind of miss is again MMORPGs are a fantasy world that we're all buying into. Like, it's so cool when you get a fancy sword, even one that's not like, like it's because it closes, but even like a plain looking sword, but we know takes a lot of work to get is that we all bought in. We are all like, okay, we all acknowledge that you've invested that time in that. Like, it's worth that many hours to all of us because we're all here. And I think that a lot of the old school teams, like building that group, again, because it's, mm. it was costly to just storm away and be like, okay, you're a terrible tank. And I'm leaving. Like, and they're like, well, okay, I guess I hope you have a couple hours to find a new group because that might be how long it takes. And mm -hmm. versus, you know, okay, going like learning that lesson of like, okay, I'll control my temper or I'll I'll help instead of hurt. Like, like, you know, taunting this person every time they do something wrong is just making them worse. Like, I do think there's a lot of value there. And I think people miss, I don't know, to some degree, miss that opportunity that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that did spark something for me that I could probably talk about all night but um, let's keep i mean i'm not afraid of this again we i think we can always cut it for another episodes or if an episode goes right we'll just give it a different title <laughs> bam just like that we saw we saved that episode so you know and i do want to link this away from the gaming back to the education side um, okay you know we all have strengths and weaknesses in real life it's just a, a fact of humanity no one is perfect, no matter, you know, who you are. There is something that someone else does better than you. Um, and why I'm going into this is I'm now going to go back over to the video game side and talk about how do those roles emerge, right? Like, 
in the very early like days of World of Warcraft, or you know, World of Warcraft is actually a relatively new. But we're talking like EverQuest, RPG. RuneScape, yeah, EverQuest, What's, like, the old RuneScape, mods, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, and so like, how did people decide like, okay, we're gonna need a tank and a healer and some damage dealers? Like, why weren't people just running around like? We're all going to play wizards because wizards are cool and they can like blast things. And what brought about this need is the fact that, you know, if you all play wizards, yeah, you can definitely blast. But the moment you find a, a challenge that is, you know, less immune to more immune to just blasting, either it's got like enough hit points and hits hard enough that you can't blast it down before it catches up to you or... You know, wh whatever particular challenge that is, there were these challenges that couldn't be overcome by just having, like, all of one thing. You couldn't just have four super tanky guys with heavy armor and swords and shields just slowly whittling things down because they themselves would get slowly whittled down. You couldn't just mm -hmm. have a bunch of healers healing each other up all the time because eventually they would just get, like, well, one shot and not my be question able to be that I And I'm hoping to not interrupt you too badly, but it was like... With that in mind, so why are game designers then, like, why are the only games that survived and were successful the ones that had multiple roles that were required to balance each other? Like, why do you think that's so appealing to us? So why, is, yeah. Well. Man, but, so yes, that's sort of where I'm going with Oh, this. okay, that's what I thought you were I Sorry. actually don't think, I don't think that, I think that became a thing over time. Okay. But I don't think it's because games have to support that environment. And I'm actually going to refer to Elder Scrolls Online, you know, as we've discussed, it's you know, one of my favorite games of all time. Mm -hmm. um, in Elder Scrolls Online, they've actually taken sort of a novel approach for a modern game, um, which I don't want to get too crunchy into the nerd talk, but in, say, World of Warcraft, right, you pick a class, so you are a wizard, and... When you are a wizard, you have certain skills that only wizards have. You know, you can shoot fireballs and teleport yourself and do all sorts of wizardy things, but you can never use a sword and shield because wizards do not use swords and shields. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, in Elder Scrolls Online, there are a few class-based skills. You know, you pick one of five to six classes when you start the game, at, and you can always make a new character. If But where I'm going with this is, Beyond just those few class-based skills, almost everything in the game is open to everyone. If you want to play a sorcerer who uses heavy armor and a bow, you can do it. If you want to play, you know, a fighter who uses an inferno staff and medium armor, you can do it. Um, and yet, despite all of this freedom, all of the, like, potential builds out there players of the game have self-selected into these like traditional roles um and it's because okay. as soon as you all are doing the same thing right and typically in games people want to be the damaging role not everyone but typically the that's stereotype what right is that like yeah. most random people and you're like <laughs> exactly typically people will want to play DPS the damage role because damage. They see it as, like, flashy, you get to kill stuff, you get to do, like, you know, you're either a wizard or, like, a big sneaky numbers. rogue, you're doing all this. Yeah, you can see these big numbers flashing up, you know. There's all sorts of reasons to want to play a damage character, and I am not going to be more solo that. also. I think healing and tanking, um, traditionally, it's, like, are less solo. Like, like those are much more team-based. Like, like d damage dealer, unless That's you're doing, true. like, crowd control... Like, it is very independent. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. But as soon as you get into a, an environment where it's not all independent, where you do need to have a team, if, you know, so you bring your four damage dealers and you maybe have, you know, two rogues and two wizards and you, and you start trying to overcome this challenge. And soon enough you realize, okay, no matter how we try and conquer this challenge, no matter how, like, tactical we are about it, eventually that boss, like, catches up and then he just starts killing us because we're not, like, tanky enough. And so then, you know, maybe you say, okay, you, like, Rogue One, can you wear some, like, heavier armor so that you can survive, like, a couple shots, giving us all some more time to, like, deal some damage? And Rogue One's like, huh, all right, sure, I'll put on the heavier armor. And then he goes off and, like, does that, right? 
But now, all of a sudden, like, yeah, Rogue One can tank it for just a little bit. Not a very long time because he doesn't have any healing. Like, no one's supporting him. And so then it's like, okay, wizard number two, can you, like, throw on some healing spells instead of just, like, fireballs all the time and wizard number two, you know? Okay, sure, fine. Um, and from there, we just walk the path of optimization. And that's where I've been slowly spiraling down to. Game, uh, games, game environments teach us to think along optimal lines. Um, strategically along optimal lines because as soon as you start making those differentiations and now you have rogue one in heavy armor and wizard two who's doing some healing spells it's like now still a rogue in heavy armor is going to be less like tanky less able to to keep like challenging this tough opponent and not dying than you know a fighter in heavy armor with a shield instead of a couple of daggers or whatever and so you can either all make some sacrifices or you can work together and sort of like everyone, instead of all being mediocre, everyone can be like specialized. And by uniting our specializations, we can find victory and overcome challenges. And to me, that's like the ultimate lesson of any like online teamwork game of which the MMORPG is sort of the, the classic example, but this can be applied to all sorts of games, right? Like MOBAs is a game that we didn't have the time to talk about today, but mm -hmm. it's a relatively recent game type. It, it focuses on like fast paced player versus player combat, usually in small teams of like three to five people, three to six people. And, you know, when developers made the first few MOBAs, they didn't inherently say like, Okay, Sorry, one second. Guys... Common MOBAs, that's like, we're talking Dota, League of Legends. Dota, League of Legends. I would even classify some of more, like, recent, like, shooter games. Um, like, um, what's the one that's really popular right now? Oh, uh, Valorant? Valorant. There was the one that came before Valorant. Uh, Legends? I know you played it for a bit. <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about. I don't know the name of it is right now. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so that's I would almost yeah. categorize those as MOBAs rather than like the first person shooters that they really technically kind of are. Because, you know, you've got this diverse cast of characters. You can choose to play almost anything that you want. Um, and yet, you still see that in the end, teams sort of auto sort into like, okay. Oh, Overwatch. That's, that's a good example of that, then, right? Overwatch is a great example, but Overwatch forced the system on you, which I think is a key difference. And I don't think Overwatch was wrong to do that. But in Overwatch, you know, they've put in a... Uh, they eventually, a yeah. It's true, they eventually did. But even before they forced you to do it within a team, they highly suggested it by saying, like, okay, these guys are the tanky guys, these guys are the healy guys, and these ones over here are the damage ones. Um, whereas I think games like Valorant and the other one whose name I'm forgetting, League of Legends, like... I they don't explicitly smite, tell you that. Paladins, awesome knots. I don't. Here's the storm. Okay, wait. So wait, I'm gonna poke um, some holes in your theory, and I want you to, to fill those holes. Here we go. All right. Those all sound like they're by design. Like even going back to your original one of Elder Scrolls Online, that is designed by the game creator. Like like they intentionally built this boss so that you couldn't just burst it down with DPS. Like like they're in some ways I think. The game designers and all the examples we brought up, including Overwatch, uh, is very much trying to force people to adopt multiple roles of at least that three. I feel like in some games there's like more, but like that that triangle three of like supporter, tank, and DPS. And I guess why are they doing that? Is that just really appealing to humans? Is that a motivating thing? Or what why do you think it does end up that way? Because you're right, we optimize into it naturally. But I, I got to say that's by design, right? Well, so this is where I think it, it's important to separate like modern game design from like what caused this way of thinking to emerge. Okay. Yes. It's very prevalent in modern game design. Um, but in the original like, you know, in like EverQuest say, right? Like there, you had all these classes, but they weren't as restrictive, I guess, is what I would say. And so people sort of fell into these grooves, but the grooves weren't pre-laid. Mm -hmm. And I think 
that's what's important. And and that's what I will say, you know, about Elder Scrolls Online is that the developers actually didn't make it that way. I've seen people do, you know, even some of like the harder content in the game. And it's like, we can do this without a healer. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we can find a way for like our DPS to give up just enough of their DPS skills to slot some heals and our tanks can, you know, like kind of find a way to be like still tanky, but like help heal themselves a little bit and and we'll figure out a way to get through it. Um, And yet, you know, the majority of people fall into these grooves because it's easier when we complement each other's strengths rather than just trying to be good at everything. Mm -hmm. Because, and this is where, you know, we get back to the educational thing and like what is the lesson that's really, really great to take away from these games and why should you think about you know, either playing them yourself or implementing them or something similar in your classroom is that, and I'll I'll say this in terms of games and then explain what I think it means in real life. As soon as you decide to take on the full weight of, you know, I'm going to be the super amazing DPS who could not die and keep myself healed up, you're putting a huge burden solely on your shoulders. And yeah, there are people, you know, in games who are, are high enough skill or high enough experience or some combination of the two. Maybe they just have, like, all the mythic gear that lets them do that. Yeah, absolutely. There are people who can do that. Mm-hmm. But it takes so much more skill, time, and experience than allocating the work. And, and I think it's more workload. fun. I like, like, if you're this, like, I'm geared, I'm level 70, I'm just going to run through this level 60 dungeon by myself, and I don't need to deal with, you know, proper group formation and teamwork. I think you realize really quickly uh, that it's a lot less fun. I like it's a lot. The reasons for even if you're like, probably yeah, yeah. But taking it back to the real world, you know, either to like the classroom or to the the professional sector. If you try and just be the one person that does everything within a company or like you know, within a classroom, if you have like the one student who like always answering all the questions right that person's eventually going to hit their limit um i think we can look at like sports teams too as an analogy here eventually if you have like this mediocre team that they just have like this one rock star on on the football team or whatever yeah that one person can you know sort of like carry and and do really well for a long time but eventually Mm -hmm. they can't do it all alone and so maybe you would have done better in the long term. I will even say you would have done better in the long term by raising up everyone and finding out like, okay, I may be like super fast, but you're almost as fast and I can throw a lot farther than you can. So you go run ahead and I'll throw the ball to you. Um, And so by finding ways to be cooperative, we can all be more successful. And I think that applies not only in the gaming environment, but also in life. That brings us to the end of today's cast. We hope you had fun, learned a little, and join us next week. Don't forget to subscribe for new episodes each Tuesday. You can also find us on social media at Plotting Podcast or on our subreddit r slash Plotting Podcast.